Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second meeting of our reading group. Today, we will be discussing Yen Fire. Um, so as you are probably aware, we're raising funds this time for Dr. Matulu Shukur, who I'll be reading a little bit about at the end of the meeting and sharing a link to make a donation at the end of the meeting. But FYI, the link is also posted on the bulletin board of our Populi group, so you may find it there. Hopefully we'll have another lively discussion today. Our intention is for this to not just be a lecture, but an interactive discussion with questions and comments from all participants. If you'd like to ask a question, please either wait for Dr. Wilcox to stop and ask for questions or use the raise hand function. And I'll do my best to call on you when the time is right. You may also drop your questions into the chat box and I'll ask them on your behalf. Thank you so much to Dr. Wilcox for donating her time and energy to translating and presenting the passages we're going to examine today and to Emperor's College for hosting this event. So now without further ado, Yin Fire. Hi humans. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Emperor's College. Thank you, you guys. Um, so let's see, let me share my screen. This one. and get my little pen and one or two more clicks and I'll be ready to go. Okay, there. Um, so yeah, I was asked to talk about yin fire. Um, I'll admit it's not an area that I had spent a lot of time pondering. I've read Pi Wei Lun in translation and parts of it I've like translated for myself. Um, but, you know, I was never big into the concept of yin fire. So I will admit I, there may be some deficiencies. You might ask a question and I might say, oh, you know, I'm not sure about that, but probably I have figured it out a little more than most of you here so hopefully this will help um in case you don't know Li Dong Yuan the first person who talked about the concept of yin fire um you can see his dates here he was one of the four great masters of the Jin Yuan dynasties he's a really important doctor and his book Pi Wei Lun is highly influential but he wrote a bunch of other books too. And he's just one of the big names in Chinese medicine historically that has very much influenced the way we practice today. So, um, oh, I did update the translation a little bit. So if you downloaded it a long time ago when I first posted it, there's like a new version of it that's up. And actually I added this slide in yesterday. I wanna point out to you like, I don't know if you watched Game of Thrones or whatever, but everybody, the internet's all like, you know, in an uproar because they found a Starbucks cup on the set, which obviously is from the wrong time period. And so what I want to, why I'm using this picture is to say, there are two different questions. When we say, you know, what is minister fire or you know whatever we're asking about what does something mean in tcm that's like the starbucks cup from a certain time period but if we ask what did Li dong yuan mean by minister fire that may be a totally different question and so today i want to talk about what did Li dong yuan mean for the most part and it may be different than some of the things that i've even taught in fundamentals class because Li dong yuan it well it's like monday morning quarterbacking they call it where you know when they're playing the game they don't know what's going to happen but on monday morning after the game you have retrospect and so we have to kind of separate out why is Li dong yuan so you know, talking about this so much, why was it significant to him? Because it may, some things may seem obvious to us today from the theories that have developed afterwards. And in addition, we could ask, well, then what did Zhu Danxi mean by minister fire? What did Zhang Jiebin mean by minister fire? So what I want you to understand is we're talking about guys like hundreds of years before TCM style, and they may have defined terms differently 
than what you've learned. So we just have to keep this in a separate box from TCM, okay? Um, so here's the first paragraph. And if you did already look at the slideshow or the, or the you know, Word document that I PDF'd, you know I also defined a lot of things, but you may have further questions or clarifications. So this is um, not the beginning of the chapter in P. Wei Lun. There's some introductory stuff that's just kind of like, well, heaven and earth, this and that. And it's not stuff we have time for with only like an hour and a half. So um, he says, if eating and drinking become irregular, or cold and warmth become inappropriate. And I do have a question about this cold and warmth because usually um, if you talk about um, food, they don't really use this word. They don't use this word, this word for cold, they use lung, a different word for cold. Um, so I'm wondering if he means weather here, but it's not very clear. So it could mean colder, warm food, it could mean cold or warm weather. Anyway, if these things are inappropriate, the spleen and stomach become damaged. And the reason why I think he's referring to food is because weather isn't the main thing to damage the spleen and stomach, but still cold isn't usually the word, this cold, this Han cold, isn't the word that's usually used for food. In any case, so if food becomes inappropriate, spleen and stomach are going to have problems, or joy, anger, anxiety, and fear can also consume original qi, yuan qi. And as I've pointed out, that this is not the same yuan as source qi. Um, there's two characters that are pronounced identically. And in many cases in books on Chinese medicine, they use them interchangeably. But Li Dong Yuan did not use this original qi to mean the same thing as source qi from the kidneys. So that's the first thing we have to do is not read this as the kidneys type Yuan qi. He's not talking about the kidneys in the, for the most part. He's talking about spleen and stomach. And it seems, although he doesn't really define Yuan qi anywhere that I could find, it seems that he means this original chi to mean the same thing we mean as right chi, all the good proper upright chi in the body, or maybe post heaven chi, you know, chi that's made by the spleen and stomach. So any questions so far? Okay. Um, then he says, once so um, emotions can bother Yuan Qi, like they can bother post heaven Qi. It's something we talk about in fundamentals class even, and I'm sure you talk about it in later classes. We talked about how emotions can, you know, cause constraint and harm <laughs> the Qi mechanism in our last session. Okay, so emotions, food and drink, he's worried about these things. So once the spleen and stomach have been harmed and they decline, once original chi is insufficient, then the only excess that exists in the body is fire of the heart. But here he seems to be meaning pathological fire of the heart. This is something that we have to think a little bit about because he says this heart fire is yin fire. And what does he mean by yin fire? Well, Yin fire can mean the heart itself because the heart is a yin organ and it's fire element, whereas, you know, yang fire could refer to the small intestine. And in fact, in old books, they sometimes do refer to the heart as yin, the yin fire organ. Um, so he's, I think he's meaning it in both ways when he says, um, this heart fire is yin fire. Well, yeah, it, it is a fire of a yin organ, a fire organ, a yin organ, but he's also saying it's become pathological. So let's see this sentence again. The only thing that's abundant now is this heart fire, but this heart fire, this yin fire 
is something that started that rose up in the lower jowl and then connects to the heart. So it's not actually the heart's original fire. It's starting in the lower jowl and it's connecting up to the heart through its system. We're going to figure out what its system is on, I think, the next slide. Um, you know, what does he mean by system? That's on the next slide. Um, but anyway, questions so far? Okay, so he hasn't explained it yet. He's going to explain it. It's kind of complex. Mm -hmm. Okay, this sentence is a sentence that I um, did edit yesterday or two days ago. And this sentence was also a sentence, if you were looking in the bulletin board, Doug Eisenstark asked me about the translation. So I thought about it some further, you know, further, I worked on it further. One of the things that helps me in translation is sometimes you just translate word by word and you make the sentence make sense. But that's actually not always the same thing as if you ask, what did Li Dong, what is Li Dong Yuan trying to tell me? And so when I asked myself, what is Dr. Lee trying to tell me, it enabled me to figure something out and change the translation. So the heart cannot govern or command. This word is like govern. This word is command. The heart cannot govern or command when minister fire takes its place. So I added in the word when. I connected these two together instead of like, having them be two separate clauses, they're now connected clauses. Um, so minister fire, um, did he say minister fire in the previous slide? No, he didn't. This is his first mention of minister fire. Um, yeah, so if you had fundamentals with me, then I talked about how minister fire is a secondary fire in the body and it can be the pericardium because that's fire element. It can be, um, you know, Ming Men life gate. And then I also said that there's some other things that ancient doctors talked about, but TCM doesn't talk about them. So we're really not going to discuss them. And so here's a place where we get to really discussing what did Li Dong Yuan mean by minister fire? So, okay, the heart is the emperor, it's supposed to govern or command. But if minister fire pushes in and locks, you know, the like the emperor in a room and starts taking over and giving orders, you know, then the emperor has lost his position and minister fire has, you know, usurped him and taken his place. Um, so we still have to discuss what is minister fire. He says that in the next sentence, but do you have any questions or comments for this little sentence? It's a very important sentence, frequently quoted. Anything? Okay, so minister fire, here he's defining, this is what Li Dong Yuan says minister fire is, which might be different than what TCM says. Minister fire is fire of the lower jowl and the bowel wall. And so we have to talk about what the heck is this bowel wall? <laughs> um, and so first off, minister fires the fire of the lower jaw. You might say, aha, Ming Men life gate. But he never says that. They actually didn't get into big discussions of Ming Men life gate until the Ming dynasty hundreds of years later. So it makes sense to us, it makes sense to me, that the fire of the lower jaw is Ming Men life gate, but Li doesn't use those words. And so in this discussion, we shouldn't use those words. We should try to understand what was Dr. Li thinking. Okay, so then the bowel wall, that's a really interesting question. Um, so, um, okay, I have this slide with all kinds of stuff, oops, about the bowel wall. And, um, Bob Flaws has translated this book. There's actually an original version and a second, you know, updated version. And the original version is just fine. You don't need the updated version, whatever. But he translates it as pericardium because one of the names for the pericardium is bow woe, but actually the bow character is a little bit different if you notice between these two. 
Um, and so the par there's so many different things that are translated as pericardium in English. There's the bao lo, the shin bao lo, there's the shin bao, there's the shin ju. All of those are translated as pericardium and they're all related concepts, but how can they all be identical things in any case? And bao lo, pericardium is considered minister fire, you know, but I don't think that's what Lee meant. And actually, then there's this recent translation from about John J. Bin, where he talks about this passage. And the translator, Alan Sarr, is such a genius, so much better than Bob Flo's translations of things. And he also, uh, like, uh, I'm not saying he agrees with me. I agree with him, but I found this after I had already translated it. So um, Baolo can refer to the uterus. And that's what I think it refers to, although, you know, of course, most men don't have uterus, um, but even in Chinese medicine, they kind of use this term that definitely refers to uterus in people who menstruate, <laughs> but, um, you know, they still use it without being gendered, so it's whatever is parallel to that in males you know um and or yeah so um in neijing there's like a bao lo which it quotes down here and there's a bao mai there's two uterine vessels um one of them the bao lo which is the exact term that li use um connects the kidneys it says it's shao yin like the heart it says it attaches to the root of the tongue um and the heart opens in the tongue um and the other the um oh great yeah elizabeth thank you um elizabeth has a slide about this and the bow um my belongs to the heart and networks with the uterus. So there is a bao mai between the uterus and the heart, and there's a bao lo between the uterus and the tongue, which it already says it's shao yin, which means kidneys and heart are also involved. And so what I think is that when he says minister fires the fire of the lower jowl and these two vessels or specifically the bowel one of the two vessels that connects up with a relationship to the heart i don't think he means pericardium um and the reason why is well remember in the previous slide he said um through its system the heart through its system and you know, well, its system could be the pericardium, but I think this um, bowel low is also part of its system, and the bowel low does have a relationship with the lower jaw, which the pericardium doesn't. Okay, so minister fire is the fire of the lower jaw and the bowel low, which is probably this uterine vessel. Minister fire is the thief of original chi. So he's thinking of minister fire as like a bad thing, or at least when it flares up, it's a bad thing. Um, and it's so it's the thief of original chi or the traitor or the bandit of original chi, the betrayer of original chi. So it's going to harm all of your good post heaven chi. Um, he says, fire cannot coexist with original chi one of them will become victorious and the other will be defeated so either you know minister fire will be victorious and original chi will be defeated or original chi will win so he's really making this minister fire into a bad guy and um you know it's going to harm original chi and this is all very famous and quoted a lot but are you saying when he says original Chi Yuan Chi, he's talking about postnatal based on the UN character. He, you know, he uses this differently than like a lot of doctors say both UN Chi mean the same thing, and they're talking about this Chi from the kidneys. 
I'm saying it because if you read Pi Wei Lun and you watch this discussion, you know, his discussions of it, he's not talking about kidneys. Look, he's talking about spleen. He's not talking about kidneys. So why did he pick original chi? I don't know why he picked original chi for this, but I mean, if you look it up in various dictionaries and so forth, you can find that it's had different meanings in different time periods and different people have used it differently. So I can't say, why did he pick this? I don't know, but it's you have to read it differently or you're gonna misunderstand what he's talking about. We have to listen to what he's trying to tell us and not fuss over his choice of words too much. We have to get the idea um, and I can't explain why he chose this, um, but if you read Pi Wei Wun, you're going to see he's not talking about kidneys. Um, so we just have to say, okay, ancient doctors thought differently than we think. Yeah. Um, so, okay, here we are. Um, so I wrote all of this about um, Baolo. Um, you know, it's you can read that separately. So to summarize what he said so far, as far as I can understand it, poor diet can cause spleen and stomach deficiency. Emotional excesses can damage original chi, which he's using to mean like all the good chi of the body, especially post heaven chi, spleen and stomach related chi. And once spleen stomach is deficient, once post heaven chi is deficient, then the only excess that's there, everything else is deficient, but there's this pathological heart fire because this yin fire rises up from this minister fire rises up from the lower jaw through the these uterine networks and vessels and flares up and he names this minister fire um which minister fire um can oh you know i haven't fixed this since i adjusted my translation so in modern times, we do sometimes talk about minister fire as a physiological thing, but he doesn't. So sorry, I kind of didn't fix this part after I kind of understood a little more what he was saying. But he thinks it's mostly pathological. Um, yeah, so we're crossing out this part. And, um, you know, he thinks minister fire is pathological, rising up through the bowel and when it should minister should always be low and small compared to the emperor you don't go strutting into the emperor like that you bow your head you knock your head against the floor but minister fire is now rising up and overstepping its position and causing trouble so once it does that it's going to damage original chi because the fire can't be in the same place as original, you know, it's taking over, it's usurping, it's doing a coup. And so there's no place for original chi. And if spleen and stomach are strong, though, minister fire can't go through the middle jaw to get up to the heart, um, is what he seems to be saying. And so when the middle jaw is deficient, there's an emptiness rather than like an earthen barrier, an earthen wall. And so now minister fire can flare up and he's going to talk about this more. So trying to, I like it if I can make a diagram. Sorry, I'm talking too much. This is more like a lecture, although I do appreciate the questions that I'm getting. I'll ask for questions in a minute. So. He said only one can be victorious. So if original chi is victorious, this is physiology, not pathology. So a healthy spleen stomach, then we know spleen chi should ascend. Okay, that's fine. And then we have the lower jaw and the kidneys and minister fire will remain small because there's this earthen barrier. So minister fire cannot flare up through the bowel lobe. Here, this two-ended red arrow is the bowel lobe that connects the kidneys with the heart. Um, but while that opening is, that 
Baowo is still there and the connection is still there. It's not like a big enough connection because it's moderated by earth. Remember, earth drains fire. So if you have too much fire flaring up, I mean, you can cook on a earthen pot if you're careful, or you can have a firewall made out of earth. The earth will prevent the fire from passing through with full force. And so as long as earth is strong, this minister fire isn't going to be able to flare up excessively. It will stay low and small down below. When minister fire is victorious, so that's pathology because he thinks minister fire is not a good thing. Then he's worried that minister fire and original chi, they can't both be in the same place and they kind of switch positions. So what happens is when the spleen and stomach are deficient, then you know one of the things that can happen is spleen chi can sink and fall downward. And when it, there's not enough earth now to drain fire. So now minister fire has a bigger opening and there's not this thick earthen wall between it and the upper jaw. So it can flow up way too much. And in addition, he mentions dampness when he talks about Bujang Ichi Tang. So he hasn't mentioned dampness yet, but he's gonna mention dampness eventually. And so when spleen is deficient, we know there can be dampness and dampness seeps downward. And so when this dampness pours downward, well, we can kind of, I mean, I, I think you've heard me compare um, Jing to an oil lamp, you know, to the oil in the oil lamp, right? And then in modern, in later terms, Ming Men is, or Kidney Yang is the fire that's burning you know, off of the oil of, of Jing. Um, so that fire is minister fire, that fire is the fire of the lower jowl. But if you pour water, the dampness on an oil fire, the Jing and the minister fire, well, you know, like if in your kitchen, your wok catches on fire and you put water trying to make the fire go out, it flares up tremendously. And so not only is there no earthen barrier, but the dampness pouring down makes the fire really flare up intensely. And there's a video with, there's a link to a video about um, putting water on an oil fire. So you may want to watch that just to see how the ancients were thinking because they knew just like anyone who's had a fire in the kitchen and tried to put water on the oil fire, everyone knows, oh, you better not do that. So the ancients knew that. Okay, so that's the first paragraph. So many new concepts, so many new terms or redefined terms. Well, questions, I've been talking way too much. Say something. So what did Li Dong Yuan mean by the lower jiao? And is that different than how we think of it today? I think he, he is meaning kidneys. He's going to mention, yeah, here he mentions kidneys. Um, of course, he may include other things in the lower jowl, but I think in this discussion, he is talking about kidney yang. But, you know, we just want to be careful not to impose things like Ming Men, which is a fancy name for kidney yang, but actually other doctors said other things about it, you know, so we just are trying not to use terms that he didn't use is what I'm saying, if we want to understand this passage, but he is mentioning the kidneys here. Um, and so I think he means kidney young is what he's talking about when he says the fire of the lower jowl. I could be wrong, you know, to really, really understand this, I'd have to read a whole lot more of Pi Wei Lun and his other books. Um, you know, I, I'm not, a, I like Lee a lot, but I'm not an expert on him. And so to get the full context, I'd have to do a lot more research. So for you or anyone who listens to the video, I apologize if I get something wrong, please let me know. Um, it's interesting that he didn't speak of age as a factor or could that 
be, yeah, he didn't, he's not talking about aging here. He's talking about lifestyle, emotions, and food. I think this could be anyone of any age. Um, you know, what we're going to see if we were to do a lot more research is Judan Shi, he's going to have a different take. He's going to take this idea and adjust it towards his theories. And I'll mention that a little bit later. So no, Lee was really talking about emotions and diet. He wasn't talking about aging. And while kidneys are part of this, kidneys are not his big concern. His big concern is spleen and stomach. And then Judan Shi goes to the kidneys. And so you would probably be less surprised about what Judan Shi has to say about this, a later, a doctor like a hundred years later. Um, yeah, so, um, okay. I wonder, and, I'll, I'll ask a question, Lorraine. I wonder yes, if, if also though, if, because of the connection with them, just thinking about going back to the Baumai and and how the emotional problems can lead to chi stagnation and that Baumai was also maybe related to Chiang Mai and that he talks about, does he talk about Chiang Mai? And I'm just thinking about how, um, how it's related to the Chiang Mai being also related to the stomach. I would have to go check, but in this chapter, he's not talking about Chiang Mai, and I don't recall him associating Chiang Mai with stomach. You might associate Chiang Mai with stomach. Right, that was my question. We're not talking about TCM, right. we're talking about Dr. Lee, and I don't right. think- That was my question. Yeah, I don't think he does, but I can't absolutely say so because I'd have to do a lot more reading and like search for the word chong in his writings and see but that's not in this chapter i can tell you it's not in this chapter it, is it fair to say that um though when we're talking about ministerial fire and you said that the idea of ming men fire didn't exist yet right is that, is that what you said it well it didn't the term Ming men existed and was mentioned in Nanjing, but it wasn't specifically associated with fire. It was more associated with qi. But so could you still would would it still be what when we have the idea of the fire within the water, the fire in the kidney, right? Yes. Is that is that something that existed then? That I idea? Think, I think that idea existed, especially because of um things like Kan Gua. Um the Kan trigram has a water you know, a yin line on bottom, a yang line in the middle, and a yin line on top. And while more of this discussion takes place later in the Ming dynasty, but that idea of that yang line in the middle of water um, is an idea that, you know, probably, uh, I'd have to, I'd have to look and see the dates and look for quotes, but I think there was some amount of that idea. Um, but kidney yin and kidney yang is two different things and you know like a lot of the discussion about that is ming dynasty which is after this um so you know people built on previous things you could build that on this but it's not here <laughs> um yeah and uh, let me just i know you know time is passing but let me just um tell you a little bit about Li Dongyuan himself. He was a rich guy. Um, he was, you know, literate and scholarly, but he wasn't highly motivated to be a government official because he was a rich guy already. Like, you know, he didn't need to climb the social status by becoming a scholar. And he lived in what's now called Kaifeng, but it was called Bianjing then, and it was the capital of the Jin dynasty. But he lived at the time the Mongols took, you know, overran the Jin dynasty. And so he's living in this walled city that was under siege and people were dying and there was like epidemic evils going around. And he had already studied medicine like as a hobby, but he wasn't a practitioner. But he saw, can you imagine the emotions when you're in a walled city under siege by the Mongols? And then can you imagine what your diet becomes as food runs out more and more and more? And so in the past, you know, Shang Han Lun is all about um, external attack. And even the earlier two of the eventually four great masters, 
Luan Su talked about heat evils invading and um, Zhang Zihe talked about excess, everything's excess, so you've got to attack it. And he's the first guy that really, really emphasized supplementation and deficiency and that how, you know, it's not all about weather. It's not that he says weather, you know, he definitely said, yeah, weather causes disease, but everything is not weather. You guys are calling everything weather. And it's like actually emotions and diet in many, many, many cases. The people who were dying when his city was under siege were not dying from external attack. They were dying from, you know, emotions and, you know, food problems. And so he said, stop talking about weather about everything. It's not all about weather. <laughs> and he even his first book he wrote was about differentiating external and internal. Well, you and I would think, why would he write such a book differentiating external and internal? That's easy. Like that's something we talk about in fundamentals class, but it wasn't talked about in fundamentals for people at his time. He's like the guy that started saying, you better think about, you know, internal issues. You better think about um, emotions and, and food. So so we have to understand his time period and kidneys had not become the huge deal at this time. Ming Dynasty, kidneys were the thing, <laughs> but not yet. Okay, so should I keep going? Did we already look at this slide? Uh, so when spleen and stomach chi, um, when spleen stomach chi is deficient or when spleen and stomach chi are deficient, then there's downward flow. We know when spleen is deficient, spleen chi should rise and now it's falling. So there's downward flow towards the kidneys. This is his first mention of kidneys in this section. And then at that point, when spleen chi is flowing downward, this yin fire, this minister fire that rises up from the lower jiao can take advantage of earth because it's so deficient and it's like sinking. And so it's leaving it empty. So there's an empty space. So I say anything important, spleen chi can fall when it's deficient. So there's an opening for yin fire to flare up through the middle jiao. There's nothing to stop it. As spleen she falls down, so does dampness again. He hasn't mentioned dampness yet, but he mentions it later in the description of Bujang Ichi Um, So here's where I tell you to think about like dampness as like a kind of water being put on an oil fire and it flares up so strongly. But even if there's no dampness, without the earthen barrier, the fire can just flare up. Um, and so, so he talks eventually about like original chi um, and and minister fire kind of switching positions because you know the spleen's chi goes down and minister fire goes up and so they're switching positions. And so you know there's this link, but I don't think. If we have time, we can look at that video. It's fun to watch, like you know, explosions. <laughs> Um, okay, so any questions before I move to the next paragraph? Okay, so at the beginning of spleen conditions, chi, and he's talking about the chi of yin fire, it moves upward and it's going to bother the lungs and result in panting, like, you know, gasping for air. The body is hot and there's vexation. Um, the pulse is flooding and large, headaches develop, thirst that just won't go away develops. The skin can't endure, can't withstand wind and cold. So now there's fever and chills, but don't be fooled. This is yin fire surging upward. And so it makes qi counterflow up. And that upward flow of qi makes the panting, the shortness of breath, you know, lung chi should descend. And when there's this upward flow of chi, lung chi can't descend. It makes the heat, it makes the headache, it makes thirst, it makes flooding pulse. So a flooding pulse is a heat pulse. Thirst is heat, vexation heat is heat. The upward movement is panting and it, even it flares up to the head. So it causes headache. 
Um, so he's talking, this is at the beginning of spleen condition. So other things can happen later, but he's talking about the early stage. And then this, the skin can't withstand wind and cold. So there's fever and chills. He'll talk about that in more detail in the next section. So, you know, as the fire's flaring up, it makes lung teeth flare up and it reaches the head causing headache and the fire causes all these heat sensations and so forth. Okay, questions, questions? I told you this was complicated <laughs> and not TCM. Um, okay. So when spleen and stomach chi flow downward, then gu chi, the chi of food, grain chi, cannot rise upward and outward. Floating means kind of outward movement. Rising and floating are both yang characteristics. This is a malfunction of the birth command of spring. Actually, I think birth is a very poor translation of this character in this context. I think life is better, but Remember, wood is birth, um, fire is growth, earth is transformation, metal is withdrawal or harvest, and water is storage. And so spring is associated with wood, so it's associated with what we call birth, which again, I think is a poor translation in this context. Um, it means life, coming to life, okay. So here he's saying that this upward and outward movement um, that should happen, but from wood elements is not able to happen because the chi spleen's chi is flowing downward instead of upward and outward. The grain chi is flowing downward and upward and outward, not upward and outward. <clears throat> Excuse me. So because you know there's no spring going on within the body, there's no, you know, wood isn't having the proper movement he's not specifically mentioning liver but you know the grain she is not moving up and out like springs movement there's a lack of yang that you know if it's not upward and out yang is upward and outward and there's a lack of that so yin and wei are having their issues <laughs> Um, the result is that the person can't endure wind and cold we know if there's wei qi deficiency then you know you're gonna be vulnerable um and so this engenders fever and chills and all of this is not actually external wind and cold it's insufficient spleen and stomach chi and if you just release the exterior and promote sweating you're going to make the patient even worse because they're already deficient what you have to do is strengthen spleen and stomach um so um you know, I already talked about these things. So note that the whole problem is in large part due to improper ascending and descending. It's true that deficiency is the cause, but he's also extremely concerned in all of his writings about the proper ascending and descending. What is called the chi mechanism, although I don't know if he uses that term, but he is really especially worried about the ascending and descending of the spleen and stomach not just their deficiency so he cares a lot about movement as well as as you know strength so summary grain chi should be sent up by the spleen but spleen is too weak can't do it so you're not making post heaven chi and if you're not making post chi you're not making yin and wei um so both yin and wei are deficient and yin chi can't nourish wei chi and wei chi can't protect yin chi so this is what's classically called a disharmony of yin and wei and so he's saying the fever and chills aren't developing from wind attacking they're developing from like yin and wei not able to do their job um from the next paragraph it's clear he, he doesn't think there's any wind and cold involved this isn't even like a deficient person who has wind and cold involved. He's saying these fever and chills totally come from the spleen chi deficiency, but it looks a lot like external contraction. And so the fever is from the yin fire. And so there's all this fire. So it makes the patient feel hot or feverish. And the chills are because the wei chi is not 
protecting so you feel vulnerable and there's not enough yang chi you know not enough ascending so you're not being warmed and also it isn't Chao Yang. But interestingly, he does use Chai Hu in this formula and mentions Xiao Yang as part of that command of spring that he mentioned before. So it will mention Xiao Yang in the formula, but this is not Xiao Yang pattern with alternating fever and chills. This looks more like a Tai Yang pattern with simultaneous fever and chills, but it's just mimicking Tai Yang. It's not actually Tai Yang. And if you use those herbs, you're just going to harm the patient. Um, yes, that Chai Hu will bring up the sinking, but he doesn't, he phrases it, we'll see when we get there, he phrases it as Chai Hu, you know, helping the Xiaoyang, and he talks about the command of spring again. Um, so he's not looking at Chai Hu exactly and Xiaoyang exactly in the same way in this context. He may look at Xiaoyang pattern, you know, in the same way as Shang Han Lun in other contexts, but here he's using Chai Hu a little bit differently than the way we learn it. Um, so are you okay? What other questions? Uh, so I had two questions, which maybe okay. one of them you're about to answer. But one, was, so are these, th is this something that you could use clinically today or would you want to reference for like further writings and you know, Judan Shi, what Judan Shi wrote about it and um, you know, is this like to, um like too early to be applicable today like it wasn't no. enough yeah you know the thing is you know how if you aren't looking for something sometimes you don't notice it um and um you know if it's like a, i have this story i sometimes tell that like I used to take a lot of photos of mushrooms and somebody said, I never see them. You know, like I go hiking and see all these exquisite mushrooms and somebody else says, how do you see them? I never see them. And it was like the first time I just happened to notice one. And then I took lots of photos and I was so excited about it that every time I went hiking after that, I looked for more mushrooms and then I saw them everywhere where I hadn't even noticed them before, but now I'm seeing them everywhere. And I think in TCM, we're trained to see certain things and that's fine, nothing wrong with that, but we're not trained to see this. And so we don't notice this. And my guess is that if we're looking out for this, not we're trying to find it everywhere, but if we are aware of this, we might see it more often. I mean, I'm actually starting to, think about um like the time when i had serious weight chi deficiency and maybe it was actually this maybe i should have been taking bujang ichi tang so in chat it says it's interesting that sometimes we assume infertility is due to kidney deficiency but it's pretty common oops something on my computer got in the way go away um, it's pretty common to see heat with chi deficiency, quite a few cases, yeah, or impotence, and we always think it's kidney yang deficiency, but it can be due to damp heat or other things, but if you just go to the first thing, and you don't have knowledge that it can be other things, you're not going to see those things. So yes, it could be, you could take bujang yi tang and use it in a different way than you've been taught to use it based on this. Did you have another question? Yes, so how would you differentiate um, the fevers and chills from spleen chi deficiency and yin fire from that of an external wound attack? Um, that's what this, I think, paragraph is gonna start talking about. So if this doesn't talk about that, then I will try to answer that question in a minute, but let me see what this says. Also, Elizabeth says, hot flash is not just yin deficiency. Yeah, and that book by Brian Grossom is really, really wonderful about hot flashes. I forget what it's called, but it's something about hot flashes. 
Brian Grossman, um, sorry, Grossman, <laughs> and like it's it's an excellent book that opens up the possibility so much to other things than just the deficiency, the fire flaring up, which it can be, but it can be a lot of other things too. And if you only see yin deficiency with fire flaring up when you see someone with hot flashes, you'll get a certain percent correct and get results, but there'll be others that you treat and treat and you just don't get it because that's not what it is. <laughs> So this is hopefully not to like take away from something before, but to expand what you are able to see. Um, okay, so let's see what this paragraph says. Although this resembles conditions obtained by externally contracted wind cold, it's not the same thing. Internal damage, which means, you know, emotions and food and so forth. Internal damage of the spleen stomach is damage to chi while externally contracted wind cold is damage to the physical body. That comes from Neijing. I didn't go look up that quote, but like it doesn't say it exactly like that, but it does say somewhere that like external attack, um, I'm paraphrasing, is damage to chi, whereas some other things, I mean, is damage to, sorry, external attack is damage to the physical body, but dim, you know, other things are damaged to chi. There's this differentiation in Neijing, but sorry, I didn't go there and look it up. Um, anyway, so he's saying it's talking about chi. It's not talking about something assaulting the body from the outside. It's talking about you know chi within the body. Damage to the exterior is excess. He uses a different phrase, but it means excess. Excess, you got to use a draining technique. You got to use draining herbs. But damage to the interior is deficiency. And for deficiency, you have to supplement. So if you have a disease of internal damage with deficiency, and you mistakenly think it's external contraction with excess, and then you drain it when it shouldn't be, you're depleting what's already deficient. And in the old books, it talks about don't exceed excess and don't deplete deficiency. And if you do that, you're going to kill the patient. It's the doctor killing the patient, not the disease. He's really ranting about, you know, how people are misdiagnosing. <laughs> yeah, this is his rant. Oh, doctors, they ranted about things, sometimes much more strongly than this rant. So I don't know. I mean, um, how do you differentiate it? Well, I think if it really is external attack, you're going to have a floating pulse, floating tight pulse if it's, you know, wind and cold, and of course the fever and chills um, and so forth, but you're not going to have all the deficiency symptoms at the same time. So, you know, this is a, you know, yeah, what did he say the pulse was? Didn't he say the pulse is flooding? Um, which is not a deficiency pulse either, but that's also not an exterior pulse. I forget where it is. Sorry, I'm still absorbing this too. I mean, this is actually really good for me because I've had to try and understand it much more deeply than if I was just like reading through the book, but I'm still absorbing these concepts and trying to understand what he's telling me. This is different from external wind attack, even if some of the symptoms are similar. So treatment has to be different. This is me talking. Otherwise, you're going to hurt the patient. So every time you see fever and chills, you better be open. Oops, sorry. Stop that. You better <laughs> be open for, um, you know, asking yourself, okay, am I confident that this is exterior attack? I mean, were they exposed to wind? Is this like sudden onset, um, you know, it, were they just out and about or sleeping under an open window or something like that? Um, or is this from long-term lifestyle and emotions? And, you know, we know how to evaluate, like we can ask about their diet, we can ask about their digestive symptoms. You know, there's going to be the chi pouring downward, <laughs> the dampness pouring downward, there should be symptoms of that. And if you see symptoms of sinking and downward movements, that shouldn't be external wind. External wind doesn't cause downward movement. 
Um, so if you see those kind of symptoms, then maybe you should consider Bujang Ichi Tang instead. Um, but TCM never, never, they used Bujang Ichi Tang, but not like this. And he's the guy who wrote it. He should know how to use it. <laughs> okay, more questions? Okay, we're getting nearer the end of this. Yeah, this is the last where he's talking and then we have the formula. And so, you know, he's saying, yeah, if you agree to everything I said, then what should we do? Um, one should only use acrid, sweet, warm prescriptions to supplement the center and ascend yang. Okay, so acrid and warm herbs will talk to yang sweet herbs will supplement. Um, and we should also use sweet cold herbs to drain fire. Cold herbs will oppose fire. Um, and sweet, there are some sweet herbs that drain fire. Um, and then the patient will recover. The classic says, and what he means by the classic is like Suen, and actually Suen chapter 74. The classic says, warm those with taxation. In other words, somebody who's exhausted and overworked, use warming herbs or warming therapy. And it also says, warm those with detriment. Detriment is a very similar term to taxation. But actually, he's misquoting. Um, it says boost those with detriment. It's the same E as in Bujong Ichi Tang. Um, it's the same E as in Ichi, boost Chi. Okay. Um, so it, he says warm those with detriment. He's going for this warming idea um, and misquoting. So did he misquote because he misremembered? Or was he doing something tricky and sneaking in like his point of view by misquoting? Anyway, that's what he says. So, you know, the classic says, you know, warm taxation, warm detriment. This he's trying now he uses a phrase that means hmm, I'm pondering that and here's my conclusion. This must mean that warmth can eliminate great heat and that you know, da zhe can also mean fever. Um, so bitter cold herbs that damage the spleen stomach are strongly prohibited. So he's saying use sweet cold herbs, don't use bitter cold herbs. At the beginning of the spleen stomach condition, so he's reminding you again, it's the beginning. There's heat in the center, meaning the middle jiao. And now I've got a treatment for it, bujang ichi tang, yay. <laughs> So what do I say? Um, you know, sweet cold herbs to drain yin fire. Can't use bitter herbs because they'll bother the spleen. Um, in later times in the Ming Dynasty, they talked about guiding fire back to its origin. Okay, and so when he says warmth can eliminate great heat. He probably means that because you've got the minister fire flaring up, you're not trying to push the heat out. You're trying to pull the heat back down to its minister position in the lower jowl. And so he doesn't use the phrase guiding fire back to its origin or its source, but you know that's kind of the concept that he's using that was discussed a lot more in the um, Ming Dynasty. Notice, that he never mentions kidney deficiency. He only mentions spleen deficiency. Um, and so when we get to Judan Shi, I mean, well, I'm not saying you and I are gonna get there, but like if you keep reading on through history and then you read Judan Shi's um, essay on minister fire, you're going to find that he's taken the idea of yin fire, although he doesn't use the term yin fire, but he takes Lee's idea, but now he says, well, it's not really this spleen stomach, it's the kidneys. <laughs> um, it's yin deficiency because Judan Shi's thing was to nourish yin and that we tend to get yin deficiency because of our lifestyle, because of aging and Judan Shi was, he, of course, he thought you had to eat properly and so forth, but he was all about the kidneys, um, whereas Lee is all about the spleen and stomach. So some of the questions you've been asking are post Judan Shi instead of pre Judan Shi. Um, he brought the 
kidney yin deficiency into it and this kind of stuff. So Lee designed Bujang Ichi Tang to treat fevers due to spleen chi deficiency with this yin fire flaring up. But if you have studied formulas, if you're in clinic, you know we use Bujang Ichi Tang all the time, but we've expanded its uses. So it's then later used for any type of spleen chi sinking because it does raise chi. So even if there's no heat, if the patient's totally on the cold side, but they're sinking of chi, Bujang Ichi Tang. And then even beyond that, any spleen deficiency, oh, use Bujang Ichi Tang. So it you know, broadened out from this very specific yin fire due to spleen deficiency with sinking of chi to now any kind of spleen chi deficiency. It's a super popular formula. So before we talk about the formula, do you have any questions about all of that? I'm talking way too much. Okay, questions, no? Okay, let's look at the formula. I know some of you haven't had formulas yet. This really is one of the most prescribed formulas. You know, it's just so, 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 you know, popular today, but he's the guy that wrote it. This is like the first time anybody's seen this formula and his formula writing style is quite different than his predecessors. Um, you can recognize formulas he wrote because they have certain characteristics, like he loved Huang Qi. Um, and it, so his formulas often have Huang Qi, Jinsing, and Baiju, which is on another slide here. And if you see a formula with those three, he probably wrote it or somebody wrote it in his style. So Huang Qi, and if it's severe, you have even more higher dose. So I have the dose here. I don't really want to talk about the dose. Gan sao, mixed fried, which means honey fried. Jir gan sao, that's the word jir for jir gan sao. Jin sing. Always like the place where the stem attaches to the root is always, you know, this says remove the reed, but like that doesn't make any sense in English. And I kind of call it the neck where the plant attaches to the big fat root. And that, heart is supposed to induce vomiting. So that's just a common instruction for ginseng. I don't know if people do it today, but anyway. But he says, don't use ginseng if there's cough. Okay. And then he makes comments about it. He says the above three ingredients eliminate damp heat. So here's where he mentions damp. Here is how we know that damp heat is pouring downward when the chi is sinking. The damp is pouring downward when the chi is sinking um, because he's mentioning it here. So the dampness is from the spleen stomach and the heat is from the yin fire and they combine to make damp heat. He says, these are sage-like herbs. By sage, he means wise people. He doesn't mean the plant sage. <laughs> these are sage-like herbs for vexation heat. He's saying these three herbs are really good at eliminating the discomfort that comes from heat, which is surprising because these are warm herbs. Huh, he's really thinking of herbs differently than you and I do. And he goes on, um, Dangwe, the body of Dangwe, not the tail. The tail of Dangwe um, moves. And he says the body of Dangwe, which is more supplementing and less moving. Um, but he wants you to bake it with like rice wine um, until, so first like soak it in rice wine for a little while and then bake it until dry or you could sun dry it. I'm assuming the sun dry is still with the rice wine and that um, mellows it and helps the harm. It does help with the movement, but it's not so strongly moving as as Dangwe tail, Dangwe way. So that harmonizes the blood in the vessels, he says. Um, note the doses are really pretty small. This is for one, one dose of, of taking, you know, one time taking it. Then Jupi, which is like Chenpi, um, do not remove the white. I forget, like the inner white part of the citrus peel, it does something different. And like, I kind of, 
um, forget, but often the white is scraped out when the Chen Pi or Ju Pi is dried, but he's saying, don't do that. And he says it guides stagnant Qi, so it helps move Qi, because remember, he's concerned with movement, not just supplementing, and also can boost original Qi um, with various sweet herbs. So people think of Chen Pi and, and the citrus as all moving and not supplementing, Supplementing, but he's saying if you use it with sweet herbs, it can help with supplementation. And he says that if it's used without those sweet herbs, then it will be draining. But he's using it with sweet herbs. Like Dangui, I think sweet is one of his flavors. Ginseng, Huangqi, Gansao is very sweet. Um, so the dose, he gives you some range of dose so you can adjust it based on your case. Now we've got the, so Huang Qi is very much raising, moves Qi upward. Um, it helps Wei Qi also, upward and outward. But now we have Sheng Ma and Chai Hu, two other herbs that have strong raising ability. So Sheng Ma does have a relationship with the stomach and it leads stomach Qi upward um, and returns it to its own position. You know, maybe we should say spleen chi, at least in TCM style, stomach chi should descend and spleen chi should ascend. But this is what he says. Um, and it enacts the ascending command of spring. Remember, we talked about that. So he's not really talking about wood like liver, but it helps with like the springs upward and outward movement and when things are sinking. And for Chai Hu, he says it leads clear chi, ching chi, you know, the clear, clean, good chi, and moves Xiaoyang chi upward. Xiaoyang, again, is associated with, with spring. Like in Wu Yun Lu Qi, it's, you know, this predictive epidemiology, Xiaoyang is associated with spring. So I don't think he means Xiaoyang in terms of fever and chills, you know, cause that's alternating fever and chills. This is not alternating, this is simultaneous. But, um, so he's not talking about Xiaoyang pattern, but he is talking about Xiaoyang as being representative of spring, which has upward and outward movement. And this does help lead things upward and outward. So it's kind of a different way than I'm used to thinking about Chai Hu, but I'm not an herbal genius. I translate things, but I haven't had like an intense practice and I don't teach herbs. So, you know, yeah. Okay. And then we have Bai Ju, which, you know, attract the lotus. It descends heat in the stomach because there's a rising up of heat. Um, it disinhibits blood between the low back and the umbilicus. I don't know what that means. That doesn't make sense. Maybe there's something wrong here, or maybe there's something if I read more of his writing. So I don't really understand what he means there. Mm, so any questions about the ingredients of Bujangi Chita? Or comments? Okay, so here's his directions for making it. Break the herbs into small pieces. You know, in the Song Dynasty, and this is just after the Song Dynasty, um, they used a lot of powder formulas um, in part because of ideas like powder scatter. So if you want to get rid of an excess, you can use a powder and the form of the herbs will help scatter the excess. But in addition, they use a lot of powders because herbs had become very expensive and like with more surface areas, how we would explain it today, you need a smaller weight of herbs to have the same effect because there's more surface area then actually a lot of formulas that are called tang, which is not a powder, it's supposed to be a decoction, they still tell you to break the herbs into small pieces because more surface area. And so they don't want you to grind it into a powder because then it would scatter. And here we don't want to scatter, we want to supplement, but they still want more surface area. So when you look at this small dose, part of it is because it's been broken up into pieces that are bigger than a 
you know, maybe pieces the size of an uncooked mung bean or something like that. And then there's a lot of surface area. Um, okay. And he's saying the above is one dose. Okay. So if you want to make, you know, a bunch, you need to double it or triple it. Boil it in two jan. Um, you know, I, I've tried to find out how big is a jan, but it's like kind of a cup that you might have in your kitchen and just like, it's not a measuring cup. So just like if I said, oh, a coffee cup or a tea cup, that's not a specific amount. Um, and this also is not a specific amount, but it's a kind of not, it's not like a big goblet or anything like that. So boil into small cups of water, boil it down until only one cup is left, you know, 50% of it. They didn't have clocks, so they wouldn't say boil for 20 minutes. They'd say boil it down to a certain amount. And then there's this sentence that I don't really understand. It says, estimate the weakness or fullness of the patient's chi when considering the amount of water. Well, I would understand to, you know, take into account the patient's weakness or fullness of chi in the quantity of herbs, but in the quantity of water, I don't get it anyway. But when you're done cooking, remove the dregs, like strain it out, take it between meals. So on a like somewhat empty stomach, take it while it's still warm. And he says, it's surprising if the damage is serious, if the, you know, it's a serious case, they won't need more than two doses to recover. But remember, he's talking about the fevers from G deficiency, and maybe the fever will be gone after two doses. But I, I don't know that all the sinking will be gone. I don't know. I mean, that's like, wow, he really has faith in this formula. If the disease has lasted a long time, you need to assess it and use modification methods. And then after that, there's like paragraph after paragraph of ways to modify it. There's like, he must have like, 30 different modifications for this formula, but I didn't translate all of that. Um, and that's basically um, this. So, you know, we don't have to hang up, we can still discuss it, but that's what I have to say. <laughs> so questions, comments? So did he consider this to be a tonifying formula or was it yeah. just, yes? Yes, for the spleen and stomach, but not only to supplement, also to raise. Like raising is really, really important to him, not just in this formula, but in general. And so was it typical to have a tonifying formula during this time period that only required two doses? I don't know about, I mean, doctors often say, this is miraculous, you know, in, in when they write a formula, this miraculous formula can bring back the dead to life. And, you know, they'll say stuff like that. So um, you do hear like all of these claims for formulas. And I imagine if it's a perfect match for the patient, you probably can have dramatic results sometimes, but I think they also exaggerate you know, beating their own chest. <laughs> what else? Yeah, so typically now we, you know, think that we need to supplement and tonify for long periods of time to get, you know, a good result, especially like with from what I understand, you know, spleen chi sinking, that's like the issue has been going on for a long time. So it's not gonna really be resolved in two doses of whatever formula, but we wouldn't expect it to. Right? So first off, he's not talking about prolapse. At least he didn't mention prolapse. Um, so he hasn't really mentioned physical changes of the body. He said, you know, this is problem with chi, not a problem with the physical body. And so I would imagine if there are really physical changes like prolapse, it may take longer than if it's just a problem with chi. Chi can respond pretty quickly. Um, secondly, 
if you're just going to take those little tea pills, you might take them forever and hardly get results. But like if you make the formula, including the processing that, you know, he mentions, you know, like, are you just throwing in any dangue or is it wine baked dangue? You know, it, so if you make the formula the way he designed it at the dose that he designed and you have a patient who's compliant, I bet the results will be a lot better than if you're just taking those little tea pills. I, I've never felt that those tea pills do much. And since I've started like making medicine, um, you know, like, you know, pills and powders and syrups and stuff like that. I've found the medicine so much more potent, but most people, practitioners don't have time to like do all of the extra work and patients are like, don't have time to even cook it. So, you know, it's kind of hard, but a highly motivated patient, I'm not saying two doses will be enough, but you know, if they're highly motivated and if you actually do the formula the way it's written, <laughs> you might have some very dramatic results. That's my point of view. Uh, Dr. Wilcox, I have yes. a question. Uh, yes. He also has specific uh, acupuncture treatments, but uh, we didn't go over that here. So my basic question here, was he more a herbalist than an acupuncturist? Yes, so all of the four great masters and most ancient Chinese doctors that were herbalists also would do bleeding and moxa on occasion. It's very, very common to find in their books bleeding and moxa, but very few of the famous herbalists did acupuncture inserting the needle. He was one of the what practitioners who did more acupuncture than others, but he was primarily an herbalist, but he did discuss acupuncture. And so, you know, actually that's a topic that we could, you know, talk about sometime is Li Dong Yuan's acupuncture treatments. And um, that, like Zhen Zhe Da Cheng, which is a later book, Ming Dynasty book, um, volume five, I know because it's one of the volumes I translated, Volume five has a discussion of Li Dong Yuan's acupuncture where they gathered his stuff from different places within the book. You know, he doesn't talk about it in one chapter, it's mentioned here and there. So he's still not doing a huge amount of acupuncture, but he did do it. Thank you. Sure. So that could be a future topic. Mm hmm. After the siege of, of Bianjing or Kaifeng is what we call it today, he, you know, the inhabitants were captured by the Mongols. I guess this city surrendered eventually because while it's no fun to surrender, it's better than being starved to death, you know, <laughs> eventually. Then he was marched to some other city as a prisoner um, along with some of the people. And it's like, I don't know, 300 and some kilometers, he was marched to this other city. And um, so maybe he had acupuncture needles because you couldn't always carry herbs with you. Maybe he got more used to like using that because it was like something he could carry with him. That's just me speculating. I don't know. Um, but after this, then he became more of a practitioner. Whereas, as I said before, he was more of a scholar that like played with medicine. Um, but after the disaster of the Mongols taking over and his experiences in a siege city and as a captive being marched, he was practicing more. Um, I imagine those are life-changing circumstances. <laughs> yeah. So if there are other questions, I'm happy to take them. On the other hand, this is supposed to be an hour and a half or so and going over is fine. But like, I think, you know, that we have a few things to discuss. Um, what I would suggest is that, you know, if this interests you, read it again a couple of times slowly and really try to 
ponder and really try to separate out, like don't make your TCM assumptions. <laughs> try to like those footnotes that I have are, are to help you to understand it's you know, he's not using the terms the same way we sometimes do. So I tried to explain his thinking and it's complex. I had, to, I've gone through it a number of times and I'm still working on it. So, Eric? I did have two more questions actually. Okay, good. So these go back to the two earlier about the um, Baluo. Um, and so, you said that um, everyone has the Baluo, correct? Yes. And so what is its function primarily other than to nourish the uterus? So Chinese medicine is all about things being so interconnected, a million times interconnected. The heart um, connects you know, with the kidneys because they're Xiaoyan and, um, you know, the heart connects with the lower jaw because of, you know, they're internally, externally paired. The lungs connect with the kidneys because the kidneys have to grasp qi. The lungs also, yuan qi comes up from the lungs, the other source qi comes up from the lungs to make a transformation in post heaven qi. And the baolo is like just another, I mean, there's so many interconnections. You don't want each jiao to be like a separate territory with no communication. You want, you don't want it to be like North Korea and South Korea. You want it to, you know, have interaction and flow. And so the function of the um, baolo and the, you know, is, is basically in addition to the uterus, it's just one more way we're so interconnected and nothing is separate and everything can influence anything. Um, that's how I would take it. In Neijing, there are 11 miscellaneous vessels. So in Neijing, there are the 12 main channels. Um, they're the eight extraordinary vessels, although they're not listed as a group. But if you look through all the different chapters of Neijing, you find the eight extraordinary vessels. They're the 15 or 16 wool vessels, if you count the stomachs, great wool. And then there's also 11 other vessels that are mentioned that are weird. And it's like hardly ever discussed And the bow wool and the bow mai are two of them. And there's just like some weird things that are mentioned like once in some odd chapter. And these are two of them. They're not talked about a lot, but um, Li Dong Yuan grabbed one of them to use in this context. Thank you. And so then he, he said that the Bao Wo is a Xiao Yin vessel. He didn't say that. That's what Nei Jing says. Um, okay. So what does that mean exactly? Just that it relates to the heart and kidneys? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't explain that here. This is Suen chapter 47 says the uterine network attaches to the kidneys as the bubble. It's a Xiaoyan vessel. It doesn't specifically say it connects to the heart, but it does say it threads through the kidneys and attaches to the root of the tongue. But since it's Xiaoyan and because the tongue belongs to the um you know, heart, we can assume that it has a connection with the heart. And then the other one, the Baumai, um, Suen 33. So you see they're scattered in different chapters. Suen 33 says the Baumai, the uterine vessel, belongs to the heart and networks or woes with the uterus. <laughs> um, so that's not what he said, but he used those ideas that those things connect between the uterus, the kidneys, the heart. Um, and that's how he theorized that this fire flares up um, through those vessels. Okay. Anyone else? Then it's all yours, Eric. Okay, so thanks everyone so much for coming. Um, I am gonna read just a little bit about uh, Dr. Matulu Shakur. So that's who we're raising funds for. Um, 
In the 1970s, Dr. Shakur served as assistant director at the Lincoln Detox Center, a Bronx, New York facility that provided community-based treatment for drug addiction using acupuncture and counseling. The work pioneered at the Lincoln Detox Center eventually became the NADA protocol, the standard ear acupuncture treatment for substance use disorder that is popular today. He also helped found the Black Acupuncture Advisory Committee, Association of America, which provided acupuncture to low-income people and the elderly, as well as training over 100 acupuncturists through its affiliate, the Harlem Institute of Acupuncture. Dr. Shakur has been incarcerated since 1986. He has terminal bone cancer and has been denied compassionate release. In exchange for attending the reading group, we're asking that you donate five to ten dollars towards Dr. Shakur's legal fees as he continues to fight for compassionate release and for his commissary. I'm going to drop a link to where you can do that into the chat, and you can read more about him on on his website, matuluShakur.com. And I'd just like to say that he is so important in the history of acupuncture in the United States, but he's it's been so whitewashed, you know, and we talk about like, you know, James Reston of the New York Times who wrote this article, but he was doing acupuncture and promoting it before the New York Times and like nothing against James Reston, but it's like, you know, the white reporter gets all the fame and the people associated with the Black Panthers get, you know, demonized, um, you know, because, you know, they were, they were doing um, preschool for poor kids and they were feeding and doing medical care for poor people. But yet what most people remember about them is like, oh, they were radical. <laughs> You know, and, and he was just so important in acupuncture in the US. Um, so we should remember him. We should say his name. <laughs> we should honor him. So also we're, um, we have a few ideas for our next meeting um, and I'll just mention them right now. We should say we don't have a date yet, but it will be next quarter because like if we, we were thinking about doing it once a month, but then that will put us at final exams or if we do it later, that would put us during the break and that just doesn't seem like the best time. So probably we'll try to do this twice a quarter. Quarter, and this will be in the beginning of next quarter. But until we've worked out our schedules, we don't have the date yet. But it, yeah, at the beginning of next quarter is what we're shooting for. So uh, one is a discussion of how the use of certain points, such as Neguan, pericardium six, has changed over time. Uh, two, the uh, use of incantations in the Junjo Dachang and other medical texts. So the Junjo Dachang is one of the uh, books that uh, Dr. Wilcox has translated a volume of. So um, incantations being like magical, like use of magical, you know, words and phrases during treatment. Uh, so number three, focused intent while needling. And number four, ancient doctors' views of female cel celibacy. And potentially also we can discuss male celibacy, whether voluntary or not. So uh, think about that, please. And I'll post about that on the dashboard of our group and um, love input from everyone about what interests you. So thank you all so much for coming and participating. Looking forward to seeing you next time. And I'll put up the video soon. I'm gonna stop recording now though, okay? Okay. <laughs>